How could you possibly think this is a good idea? A lot of ideas were not appreciated in their time. I just want to say for the record, I did not kill anyone. We are not mad, we are just disappointed. No, we are mad. Yes, we are. We are livid, but we are going to let this one slide. Thank no, you. No, we're not. I am not a mind reader, David. 2023 appears to be a challenging year for DC films striving to make their claim in the movie industry, with Blue Beetle reaching a new box office low, pulling in a meager 25 million at the domestic box office over its first five days. The film has had the weakest DC movie debut ever, setting aside Wonder Woman 1984, which still managed to make 16.7 million amidst restrictions to cinema capacity, limited release on fewer theaters, and its simultaneous release on HBO during the pandemic. Further dampening expectations, Blue Beetle's entire domestic box office earnings are estimated to hit a mere $55 million. Given its hefty $120 million production cost and additional $100 to $120 million put into marketing, and release after release of box office failures for Warner Brothers, this outcome will be a major setback for a company that seems to be hemorrhaging money with each film they put out. It doesn't help that the film's cast is absent from promotional events due to the ongoing strikes, asking to be paid more for films they don't want to promote to the public. This only exacerbates the company's uphill battle to generate buzz around the film, and ironically, any chance the people picketing had of having their demands met. There was even a point where Blue Beetle might not have even graced a silver screen, having initially been earmarked for an exclusive HBO Max release alongside Batgirl, which ended up getting scrapped altogether after it was completed. James Gunn has been vocal about Jaime Reyes' continued presence in the DCU, hoping to drum up enthusiasm for Blue Beetle by initially saying the film is part of his universe, before walking back and confirming that while the film wasn't, Zola would be returning as Blue Beetle. Given the man literally said The Flash was the best superhero film he'd ever seen, right after being given the reins to the company, I'm not sure what to believe anymore. With all that said, how does it fare compared to the box office failures preceding it? Allow me to break the ice. Well, in Blue Beetle, we delve into the life of Jaime Reyes, portrayed by Zolo Maraduena, a fresh college graduate striving to secure his family's home. His life takes an unexpected turn when he crosses paths with the formidable Victoria Court, played by Susan Sarandon, the head of the tech behemoth Court Industries. This confrontation not only costs Jaime and his sister their cleaning jobs, but drags him into a whirlwind of drama involving Victoria's disapproving niece, Jenny. Through a sequence of mishaps, Jaime finds himself inadvertently bonding with an ancient alien artifact, transforming him into the superhero Blue Beetle. Of course, this doesn't go unnoticed, as Victoria is adamant about reclaiming the scarab, deploying her armored super soldier in pursuit. The film grapples with a number of significant setbacks. Firstly, coming off the back of a number of significant box office flops for Warner Brothers. Secondly, its origins as a HBO exclusive release are glaringly evident in its final cut. The writers also borrow not just plot points and one-liners, but themes, character objectives, motivations, and even entire set pieces directly from better films. The movie is littered with cliches, tropes, and plot contrivances. We have the addition of unnecessary subplots that lead nowhere, some that abruptly stopped, while others spring out of nowhere through exposition, in addition to the lack of world building. We've got the injection of weird tonal shifts, our heroes and villains doing stupid things to facilitate plot, there's coincidences, poor character work, and an underwhelming villain. In essence, Blue Beetle feels like a TV series rather than a cinematic introduction to a DC superhero, and it manages to plunder from its predecessor so heavily that it often feels like an unimaginative mashup playlist of ideas with no synergy. I am tired of the same old phases, the same old things. In the icy expanses of a remote Arctic region, the CEO of the cartoonishly wicked Cord Industries, Victoria, is on a quest. Together with her trusted henchman, Ignacio Carapax, and her lead scientist, Dr. Jose Morales, whom she incorrectly addresses as Sanchez a number of times for some reason, Victoria is on the brink of uncovering the elusive scarab, a relic she's been after for years. In the animated opening credits, we see the blue scarab and its siblings traveling the cosmos before it reached Earth. We also learn that Dan Garrett, the first Blue Beetle, had discovered it before passing it and the mantle onto Tech Cord. With the hero then suddenly disappearing, Victoria had effectively taken control of the family company and now had hold of the technologically advanced device. Designated Kajdar, the infiltrator Scarab was one of many created by the Reach, essentially alien conquerors that were in a stalemate in their fight against the Green Lanterns, information that the writers chose to omit from the film for some reason. While the treaty between them prevented the Reach from directly engaging in conquest, the living genetically engineered weapons were created to bypass this formality. The Scarabs would essentially wait until the world they were on had reached a critical technological milestone, 
upon which it would bond with the host. The invaluable find by court puts them on the precipice of transitioning into the foremost private military contractor on the planet. Deviating from the cold, we then find ourselves in the warmth of Palmera City, a cross between LA, Miami, and Hong Kong. Jaime Reyes, fresh out of pre-law at Gotham University, returns home, eager to reunite with his family, including his duty as father Alberto, loving mother Rocio, his sister Milegro, jovial uncle Rudy, and his wise grandmother. The happy mood marked by a taco feast is momentarily dim when Milagro reveals some concerning news. His joyous homecoming is clouded by the realization that while he was away, the Reyes family has been grappling with numerous challenges. Court Industries' aggressive urban developments are essentially pushing out long-standing residents, including his family, threatening their cherished home and resulting in the downfall of Alberto's business. Not only have they bumped the rent up 300%, roughly 285% more than they're allowed to by law, you have no respect for logic. I have no respect for those with no respect for logic. But we're told that compounding their woe is Alberto's precarious health due to emerging heart issues. The funny thing is that as someone studying pre-law, he should have been able to figure out that this was illegal and that they have a class action lawsuit on their hands, but his degree never factors into the story. Still, despite these hurdles, the Reyes clan remains steadfast in their resolve to persevere. Understandably wanting to help his family, Jaime gets a job with his sister Milagro, cleaning the very grand residence of Victoria Court, the CEO of the company responsible for hiking up their rent. Eager to network, Jaime approaches Victoria and says hello while she's on the phone and looking in a completely different direction. Instead of assuming correctly that Victoria didn't hear him, his sister starts planting ideas in his head about how he, despite being pre-law, will never amount to nothing as he's Latino. Oh, come on. The irony, of course, is that the two other most powerful people in her company are Victoria's henchmen and elite scientists, who are both Latino. The writers are simultaneously saying that race is a barrier to success whilst also showcasing that it isn't. The film uses Milagro to inject weird victim mentality messaging that the writers try to reinforce instead of the inspirational notion of you can do anything you set your mind to. I should also clarify that his pre-law degree is inconsequential to the plot, and it's one of many plot points introduced and then abandoned. There's no mention of him wanting to use his degree to fight the injustice Milagro keeps complaining about. Concurrently, tensions rise in the court family when Jenny confronts her aunt Victoria about the revival of a controversial superweapon technology called the One Man Army Corps, or OMAC for short. Previously ordered to be dismantled by her father, Ted Cord, who was the former CEO before his mysterious departure, Jenny is adamant about halting its resurrection. She emphasizes her father's decision to pivot Cord Industries away from arms production. Nevertheless, Victoria's ambition remains steadfast, and she does make some good points about Ted wasting money on personal gadgets and inventions as the company began to lose money before disappearing, forcing her to pick up the pieces and try and make them financially viable, while Jenny flew around the world on private jets using family money. As Jenny faces the intimidating presence of Carapax, Jaime's protective instincts kick in, intervening just in the nick of time. I should also point out that his sister, despite being told that there was a service bathroom for the workers, decides to take a poo in Victoria's private bathroom. That was lavish. Oh shit. Realizing the guy that interrupted her argument with Jenny and the girl that just violated her bathroom were together, naturally, Victoria fires them both. Yet the day's in a total loss. Despite practically ignoring him as she went to enter her car, after Milagro notes Jenny was ignoring him because the cords looked down on everyone, Jenny turns around and properly thanks him and introduces herself. But I can take care of myself, okay? She's a cord. They're all dicks. Jenny cord. We're not all dicks. So she isn't shaking hands to say thank you or out of respect, but out of spite and contempt for what Milagro said and to prove that she wasn't as self-centered as she was behaving. <laughs> Strange introduction to both Milagro and Jenny, but let's see how it plays out. Handing him her number, Jenny suggests they meet up at Cord Tower tomorrow, promising to leverage her name to help him get a new job. In a great scene that night, where he has a poignant chat with his father about family responsibilities and future prospects, Jaime contemplates taking Jenny's intriguing offer. When daylight breaks, Jenny's covert mission unfolds within the laboratories of Cord Industries. Swiping the keycard of Victoria's chief scientist, Dr. Jose Morales, she uncovers Victoria's clandestine experiments involving the scarab. Alarmed by its potential dangers under Victoria's control, Jenny discreetly tucks the artifact inside a fast food container for safekeeping and begins to flee. Arriving at reception in his graduate suit, looking dapper as hell, 
The script wants us to believe that the receptionist who mispronounces his name repeatedly after he corrected her would also confuse him for a delivery person for allowing him to wait for Jenny. I do have an appointment. She said to drop by, so I'm sure I should. Oh, you can stand back. Okay. okay. Why don't you have a seat, Jamie? Okay. This is a predominantly Latino city, and she should be familiar with the correct pronunciation of his name. What we're seeing isn't racism, but a very incompetent receptionist. Now, despite his keycard having just been taken away from him by Jenny, which is how she entered the containment room, Jose somehow re-enters the room without a key to find the scarab was missing and initiates an immediate lockdown. Come on, don't bullshit me. Seriously, how did he get inside the room? As she absconds with it, Jaime spots her darting through the lobby and tries to follow. In the midst of the ensuing chaos triggered by the alarm, a frantic Jenny entrusts the scarab to Jaime, cleverly concealed within a burger container. She emphatically instructs him to safeguard it, emphasizing he must never directly interact with it. Bemused yet compliant, he transports the artifact home as Jenny leads some of the guards in a search. With curiosity getting the better of them, the Reyes family take the box to unveil the contents, despite Jaime having been instructed to keep it safe. You went in to get us jobs, and all you brought back was a hamburger? Okay, I don't think it's a burger. You haven't looked? What the hell is it? The sight of the unique relic prompts him to closely inspect it. However, upon physical contact, the dormant scarab awakens, dramatically grafting onto Jamie's back after entering his body through his butt. No, I'm not kidding. This abrupt fusion transforms him into a walking armory, enveloped by advanced extraterrestrial protection, and as the sentient scarab, an internal voice named Kajdar, communicates with Jaime, it begins initiating a sequence of system checks. It's like Iron Man met Alexa, the suit of armor in Jarvis AI. You've got Spider-Man with a young, intelligent and charming kid endowed with superhuman power, a bit of Venom with an alien symbiote taking over the body of a human host and giving them powers, plus some Terminator 2 with an advanced AI slash robot sworn to protect a child. This leads to an unpredictable journey, a rapid ascent into space, a precipitous descent back to Earth, and a chaotic flight through the cityscape causing inadvertent destruction before finally steering Jaime back to his starting point. The problem with the sequence is that we can't see Jaime's face and his constant screaming and yelling gets a bit grating towards the end. With the worried family in disbelief, the Reyes clan engage in a heated debate regarding their next move, fearing the police's potential harsh treatment given their suspected allegiance to Cord and the family's implied undocumented status. But determined to free himself from the scarab's grip, Jaime seeks out Jenny at the tower, commandeering Rudy's truck in the process. Upon arrival, he spots Jenny to his right, getting shot at by armed guards. Oh, what timing. It feels like there's a scene missing to explain why the guards were shooting at Jenny when their objective is to recover the scarab from her. Seems counterproductive. Even Jaime says, no way, and what are you doing here? As if that explains the coincidence and contrivance of him running into her like this. Note to writers, getting a character to highlight an issue with your script is not meta or funny, it's just irritating, because it demonstrates that you know this is a problem and you should have done better. Of course Jaime doesn't hesitate to help her again, getting Jenny to jump in before driving away. Now you might be wondering where the police are throughout all of the carnage, surely they're about to arrive and begin investigating court. Right? Wrong. The truth is, we don't see them in this film, because the story the writers want to tell cannot work in a universe where there are police, but more on that later. Feeling guilty for bringing the family into this mess, Jenny reveals her prior knowledge of the Scarab, explaining it once belonged to her father Ted Court, the billionaire inventor and second iteration of Blue Beetle. According to her, the Scarab has its own consciousness and elects its own bearer, and is effectively a world destroyer. Jenny also notes that the potential solution to Jaime's predicament could lie within her father's secret fault. Problem is, access requires a digital key safeguarded within Cord Industries. And so, armed with Rudy's homemade surveillance jammer, which is conveniently hours away from being finished, the duo embarks on a mission to break back into the building and retrieve the high-tech smartwatch. It's here that Jenny unveils the strained relationship between her father Ted and her aunt Victoria. While Ted was entrusted with the family business, Victoria, the older sibling, harbored feelings of resentment. This bitterness drove her pursuit of relentless advancement and wealth. Jaime says it sounds sexist that Victoria was overlooked and Jenny agrees, despite her explaining her father was picked because he was good while Victoria was a bad person. The writers are simultaneously calling what happened sexist, even though it wasn't, and also that it was the right thing to do. <laughs> While they do find the watch, their operation encounters a snag when Rudy's jamming device malfunctions, drawing the attention of Ignacio Carapax, garbed in an OMAC prototype suit. 
The Scarab instinctively armors Jaime, initiating a fierce showdown with Carapax, who continues to tell Jaime that his love for his family is his weakness over and over again. The writers want the theme of the film to be La Familia, but have no way to integrate this beyond having the villain, who doesn't know Jaime or his family, randomly start saying that there is weakness. Despite his valiant efforts, our hero struggles against the seasoned mercenary. In a desperate bid, the Scarab offers Jaime enhanced combat abilities by assuming complete control, granting him the ability to manifest any weapon on demand. Yet when he's poised for a lethal blow against Ignacio, Jaime's humanity prevails, holding the Scarab's deadly intent. Unfortunately, this allows Carapax to gain the upper hand, severely wounding Jaime. But in the nick of time, Rudy and Jenny incapacitate Carapax by hurling the jamming device into him. Wanting to lay low and prevent the heat from following them home, the trio make their way to the ancestral mansion of Ted Cord, and utilizing the key, she unveils a clandestine subterranean chamber where Ted once served as the masked vigilante, Lou Beetle. Although Ted possessed a scarab, it refrained from merging with him. Undeterred, Ted ingeniously crafted his own arsenal and suit, which inspired Victoria to do the same with Omac after his disappearance. We are going to change the world with the power of the scarab. It belongs to me. As Rudy delves into Ted's computer system, Kaj Da's regenerative abilities mend Jaime's injuries, allowing him and Jenny to share a moment above ground. Here, Jenny recounts her mother's profound influence on her father's transformation into a hero and the subsequent revamping of Cord Industries. However, a tragic demise when Jenny was young drove Ted into seclusion before his sudden disappearance. As their conversation deepens, they gravitate towards a shared intimate moment, but Rudy interrupts them. Hey guys, I found something that's home. Come on, Dad. From the computer, he was able to discern that Dan Garrett once bore the scarab, leading to the conceptualization of the prototype Omax suit. However, this venture was terminated prematurely. We also learn that when the scarab selects a host, it integrates them on a molecular level, zealously shielding its chosen. But there's a grim revelation. The only method to detach the scarab mandates the host's death. Of course, crestfallen by this discovery, Jaime lashes out, telling his uncle to take things seriously for once. Finding him outside, Rudy tells him the humor is a shield for him, before suggesting that perhaps the scarab isn't a curse, but a blessing in disguise. With the victorious helicopter ominously hovering past them towards the Ray's home, now under siege by court, Jaime activates the suit and flies back home, where he's met with chaos as Victoria's militarized forces detain the family and ignite a fire in the home. Although his suit proves impervious to their attacks, upon Victoria's request, who was keen to see what the suit could do, the enforcers prepare to execute his loved ones. But refusing to allow the Scarab to kill the court enforcers, Jaime manages to incapacitate most of the adversaries by other means. Yet, because he chooses not to kill them, one of the remaining guards aims his sight on Alberto and Milagro, while Victoria and Carapax ready an electrified harpoon claw to capture the Blue Beetle. Although he manages to neutralize the threat, the ordeal causes Alberto to suffer from cardiac arrest and die as Carapax ensnares Jaime and takes him away. Now, despite a private organization literally laying siege on a home, opening fire on a family in front of their neighbors, and causing the death of an innocent man, not a single police officer arrives. We only get one fire truck, an ambulance, and a weird editing sequence with the family members crying in what is clearly reshoots with little effort. As dawn breaks, a grief-stricken Rocio, Milagro, and Rudy find strength in Nana's rally cry to rescue Jaime. Joining their mission, Jenny escorts them to the mansion, arming them all with Ted's gadgets and weaponry before prepping the bug ship, an armored aerial vehicle that Rudy can now operate somehow. For a guy that can build jamming devices, pilot advanced tech, and decipher complex equipment, how is he unemployed? Why is it that poor Alberto was the only one that worked in the family until Jaime and his sister decided to help out? Regardless, confined in an ancient island bastion close to Cuba, the very place where the OMAC technology is being developed, Jaime finds himself central to Victoria's malevolent plot. Her plan is to basically merge the Scarab's intricate code into the OMAC's neural framework, seeking to mass-produce an army of enhanced super soldiers. Not sure how a company can read, process, and even understand alien technology, but, uh, okay. Her chief scientist, Jose, who Victoria bizarrely continues to call Sanchez, notes the potential knowledge to be gleaned with the host still alive. However, Victoria's ambitions cloud her judgment, and she commands the commencement of the Scarab code extraction into Carapax. Flying in the bug and now under their grandmother's strategic direction, who is revealed to be a revolutionary, they deploy Cord's advanced tech to breach the fortress and incapacitate the armed men by using bug farts. 
Within the maze-like tunnels of the base, Jenny and Milagro embark on a frantic search for Jaime that takes them to a chamber, revealing Victoria's dark vision. Thousands of OMAC entities on the brink of activation, all drawing power from the scarab. Inside the lab, Jaime undergoes torment as the code download ravages his body, causing his vital organs to falter. On the brink of unconsciousness, a vision of his father appears, urging him to welcome his fate and harmonize with the scarab rather than resist it. His father says, my purpose was to be here with you, implying his purpose in life was to support a family that was unwilling to share the workload and then die, only to reappear to Jaime and tell him to bond with the scarab. Oh, shit! Not only is the execution of this emotional moment set up poorly, but it should be noted that this is literally the scarab manipulating Jaime into having a second win. It clearly has motivations and a will of its own, but the film doesn't want to address that or the truth of its origin. Concurrently, Jenny and Milagro set off explosives on the power generator that disrupt the data extraction. Despite that, because we need a boss fight, Carapax's OMAX suit still manages to attain its full capabilities. Jaime, now wholly in sync with the Scarab, breaks free, but it informs him that it required a momentary recovery period to reboot. The Blue Beetle suit rebooting is just the riders using another plot contrivance to raise the stakes artificially, because they know Jaime is practically invincible now. Angry that Victoria calls him Sanchez once again, Jose switches sides and helps the boy escape, but pays the ultimate price at the hands of the newly enhanced Carapax. In a desperate escape, Jaime is pursued and trapped by an array of soldiers. Unexpectedly, his grandmother then appears wielding a machine gun and massacres them. Here I need to point out that his entire family slaughtered nearly a hundred people. They tried to kill them so I guess that's fair, but the point that I'm making is this undercuts the importance of Jaime's rule of not killing people. The tone and messaging is just all over the place. Separated from Milagro by an explosion, Jenny finds herself ensnared by Victoria and his subordinates, while Milagro is also cornered by enemy forces. Having achieved perfect harmony with the Scarab, Jaime swoops in, neutralizing the threat and reuniting with his sister. Yet the triumphant moment is short-lived as Carapax emerges and begins to overpower him. The situation takes another dark turn when Rudy is seemingly annihilated by a missile from Carapax. Overcome by grief and fury, Jaime gains a sudden edge. Poised for a fatal blow and driven by thoughts of retribution for his father and uncle, Jaime is halted by an unexpected intervention. Having experienced a fleeting connection with Ignacio during the download, the Scarab reveals the tragic tapestry of his life, from his unwilling induction as a child soldier to Victoria's manipulative clutches, where he was molded into an OMAC test subject, and the heart-wrenching loss of his mother in a senseless bombing, which softened Jaime's heart, causing him to offer mercy rather than seek revenge. Unlike his psychopathic family who were taking joy in the mayhem they were causing with Ted's equipment, Seizing a helicopter and dragging Jenny along, Victoria reveals she possesses Scarab's code on a remote device, ensuring her dreams are still within reach. Why doesn't she kill Jenny, and why is she even telling Jenny this in the first place? Well, my friends, that's because Victoria is one of the stupidest villains I've seen this year, taking the third spot behind Hillary and Montez from the Meg 2. It's all bullshit! All of it! Of course, now knowing this, Jenny uses her father's ingenious defensive foam gadget to propel herself and Victoria safely from the helicopter. And despite the ample time Victoria has to retrieve the device, which is only an arm's reach away, she watches as Jenny destroys it by stepping on it. Enraged, Victoria orders Carapax to annihilate them, but in a twist, he rebels against her, choosing to self-destruct and kill them both instead. While Rudy is revealed to have survived and Jaime's big payoff is not killing Carapax, despite how angry he was, he then just watches as the man he saved drags Victoria into a fire and explodes, wiping out the fortress, the entire Ermac army, and every other person that worked there. In the aftermath, we see the Reyes family mourn the loss of their patriarch, finding solace in their tight-knit community, who we suspiciously never saw throughout the film, you know, giving them aid and whatnot after the shootout. It's like an afterthought, because the writers forgot to add a community into the script to complement the message of family and togetherness that should be driving the story. With Victoria dead, Jenny assumes the role as court industry CEO, pledging to one of her father's ideals. As a token of gratitude, she then gives Rudy a brand new truck for the one destroyed in her rescue and promises to spearhead the rebuilding of the Reyes family home, which they were still renting from court. Considering Jenny put their lives in danger and led to the death of Alberto, it's weird that all she did was give Rudy a truck for the one destroyed in her rescue and promise to fix the damage that her company did to their home. I know it's ridiculous, but the Reyes family effectively saved Palmera from Skynet-like oppression and defeated Victoria, effectively giving Jenny everything she ever wanted, while she leaves them with no more than what they started with, less if you count the fact that their patriarch was dead as a result of her. When Jenny mentions returning to her father's mansion, Jaime offers to accompany her, culminating in a kiss between the two packed with horny energy before they flew off. 
Amidst the newfound peace, an eerie message then pierces the silence of the Blue Beetle's hidden chamber, a distorted transmission from none other than Ted Cord himself, reaching out to his daughter with the revelation that he's still breathing. You have to think like, what haven't we done before? Well. I never thought this story was gonna be told, but I'm so happy because we've been waiting for it. One of the major problems I had with the movie revolved around the portrayal of Jaime's family. The film's commitment to showcasing a Latino superhero and his family dynamics should be commended, but the execution leaves much to be desired. Instead of encapsulating the heartwarming essence of familial bonds, many of Jaime's relatives seem more irksome than endearing. <gasps> oh, I forgot how bad it looks. I've seen worse. Where? You don't want to know. Okay. As the narrative unfolds and Jaime inherits the crucial scar from Jenny Court, he's warned about its potential risk. However, this warning falls on deaf ears with his family, especially when Uncle Rudy, a character George Lopez imbues with his comedic signature. Whoa! It's like Batman stuff. Batman's a fascist. And his niece Milagro frivolously tosses Scarab about, making light of its significance. What I'm saying is that the comedy is often at odds with the tone the scenes are trying to build. His sister Milagro is insufferable, entitled, and consistently denigrating to Jaime, humiliating him for trying to make a better life for himself. She ruins his first day back by going against the family decision to celebrate his success, opting to tell him all their woes instead. She takes a shit in her employer's toilet and complains about racism when everybody would have fired her. She continually holds Jaime back by saying he won't amount to anything because he's Latino, and I don't understand why she was written this way. She doesn't have an arc or a journey, she's just perpetually in complain mode. Okay. You're a Mexican in the edge keys, Canal. That progress is not for us. Ironically, while complaining about racism we don't see in the film, Milagro ends up saying some of the most racist, self-hating nonsense in the film. Additionally, the family in their boisterous way often puts Jaime in uncomfortable situations, like causing a scene at Court Industries when he's seeking employment to forcing him to open the box in the first place. You're Jaime. They don't get out much. <laughs> In this ensemble of over-the-top familial portrayals, Jaime's father Alberto Reyes, played by Damien Alcazar, stands out as a pillar of understated dignity. Thus, it's all the more heart-wrenching when he's the one the narrative chooses to part ways with. What? 25%? Come on. These people make nothing. We are broke. Let's worry about money tomorrow. The film's more jarring moments emerges when Jaime gets captured. The tone is all over the place with the entire Reyes family in an overly enthusiastic fashion, insisting on joining Jenny on the rescue mission, with the film basically morphing into spy kids from this point. Nana? I advise we back away. You cannot come with us. It is too dangerous. Oh, you mean, uh... Again, it's like poetry, so if they rhyme, Mm -hmm. Every stanza kind of rhymes with the last one. Hopefully it'll work. Every member of the Reyes clan dies headfirst into blockbuster-level antics, from Rocio piloting an aircraft to Nana, our former revolutionary, manning a chain gun, all the while crying out, down with the imperialists. Oh, the irony, given the eye-watering budget footed by the very conglomerate she's condemning. Of course, every cinematic experience requires the audience to engage in some suspension of disbelief. However, Blue Beetle just stretches this notion to its breaking point, verging on caricature. There's no world building, with the only locations we ever see being the Court Building, the Reyes home, and Ted's mansion. While the film's antagonist, Victoria, feels like a budget version of Iron Man's Obadiah Stane, but with slightly better hair. Sanchez, hello. Actually, that's not my name. How much longer do you think it's gonna be? Her character is painfully one-dimensional, driven by a cocktail of greed and an insatiable thirst for revenge, mainly stemming from perceived betrayals by her late father and estranged brother, Ted Cord. As the plot unfolds, shocking revelations surrounding Victoria's involvement in grave injustices within her own ranks come to light. However, the gravity of these actions doesn't translate convincingly, either through Sarandon's betrayal or the narrative art crafted for Victoria and Ignacio. She appears to be malicious merely for the sake of it, lacking depth and any magnetic charisma crucial for an antagonist. Thus, when she finally faces her reckoning, it fails to elicit any strong reactions from the audience beyond confusion. No! Ignacio, no! Raul Trio has an imposing presence as a tormented Carapax and has a lot more going on with his character. Trying to hold on to memories of his mother, while simultaneously serving a surrogate mother that had perverted his spirit as much as his body, he's a laid character, if not a bit one note. But you never feel as though he's putting Jaime in any real danger. 
This is because the scarab has limitless power. It can practically do anything, and it won't let Jaime die, often meaning it will rob him of his agency by taking over. As a result, the confrontations are often yawn-worthy. Jaime gets it to make giant swords and energy weapons from his favorite IPs, but it doesn't matter what he chooses, because the scarab will ultimately make the executive decision, overriding his choice to preserve his life. It should also be noted that Jaime's ultimate triumph, not through brute force but by understanding his enemy, might seem refreshing, but it's very contrived. He doesn't learn anything about Carapax or Victoria directly through the story. Instead, the scarab just tells him the villain's backstory in an exposition drop right as he's about to kill him. Not to mention that him not killing Carapax is undercut by the fact that his family killed nearly 100 people, in addition to Carapax killing himself and Victoria because our hero refused to interfere. You are a stupid. Another problem I had was Kajdar is revealed to be a sentient character, but it never speaks to him unless they're in combat. It never showcases a distinct personality, operating more like a voice command software than a sentient being. This grievance may appear trivial, however, it underscores a deeper void within the narrative of Blue Beetle. They missed a huge opportunity for both Jaime and the Scarab to bond, learn about each other and then find a middle ground of symbiosis like Eddie Brock and Venom did. Instead, we have an alien that literally forced itself into Jaime's butt, cut into his spine and fused with his nervous system, only to then literally control his body and manipulate him through false visions designed to trick him into accepting the bond. For a flick so obsessed with Jaime's purpose, it's hysterically unaware of its own. The movie tries to lament over lost cultural heritage and progress, but it doesn't seem to know what that progress should be. You won't find any profound reflections on minority distrust or insights into the hard choices made by immigrant communities. The writers have a superficial understanding of sexism, racism, and even fascism, given the examples they give us, and seem to just throw the terms around like buzzwords. And it's a genuine facepalm moment when the realities of Latino struggles get reduced to comedic fodder. Yet if there's any silver lining, it's the raw talent of Zolo Maraduena, who imbues Jaime with charisma, strength, and goodwill. Given the drab script he's handed, the lad's performance is nothing short of pulling a rabbit out of a very empty hat. Ultimately, Blue Beetle is a mediocre cocktail of other heroes with only one rallying point, being the first Latino comic book superhero in a film. But don't crack open the tequila just yet, as that's not true. The much debated Zorro. No. The legendary Zorro. My name is Miles Morales. I was bitten by a radioactive spider, and for like two days, I've been the one and only Spider-Man. I have to be honest, Blue Beetle is much better than what DC and Marvel have been churning out lately, but the bar is so low that I can scarcely call mediocre that much of an achievement. With that said, if this film had dropped a decade earlier, inherently meaning it predated many of the plot lines and story elements it was borrowing from, it might have passed to something fresh. But the film is really just a patchwork quilt of best bits from other, better films. Even the character's very existence on the big screen owes everything to the giants that came before him. Much in the same way that the Scarab protects Jaime and does all the work, the writers and director thought that representation would also shield them from having to make a better film. No sequel for you. With that said, that's all for today, folks. A huge thanks to everyone that requested we cover Blue Beetle. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and check out the Film Comics Explained podcast on the second channel. And if there's anything else you'd like for me to cover, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by. Hey! Get the hell away from my sister! Who's for it?